Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are on listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, you may press star, then one if you would like to ask a question. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I would like to turn the meeting over to Ms. Erlene Dow. You may begin when ready. Thank you, Brittany. And thank you to Deborah Rivera for the, from the U.S. Census Bureau for hosting our webinar today. On behalf of the U.S. Census Bureau and C2ER, welcome to our first LED webinar of 2019. It is with great pleasure that I welcome back one of our esteemed presenters, Mr. Aaron Terrazas, as he presents Using LEHD and Zillow Data to Understand Housing Market Impacts. This webinar will focus on Zillow's use of this data to understand the housing impacts of local tech booms, including Amazon's HQ1's impact on Seattle housing market, Amazon HQ2's potential housing impact on Washington, D.C., and a recently published analysis of how Facebook's 2012 IPO boosted home values in Silicon Valley. Aaron is a senior economist at Zillow. He is a frequent commentator on the American housing market, including recent appearances in the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, Telemundo, and more. Before joining Zillow, he was an economist at the U.S. Treasury Department's Department Office of the Economy Policy, where he participated in the interagency group of economists who prepare the forecast underlying the president's budget. He started his career at the Migration Policy Institute, a nonpartisan think tank in Washington, D.C., and he received his education at Georgetown University and Johns Hopkins University. So with that, I hand it over to Aaron. Thank you, Erlene, um, and um, everyone at the, the Census Bureau who invited me to, to speak at this webinar. Um, and obviously, thank you to everyone who's, who's on the call. Um, uh, I'm excited to present um, on this, this research that we've done. As Erlene mentioned, this is uh, my second time presenting to this group. It's always a pleasure to, to return and come back. Um, you know, uh, the LEHD data that um, Census publishes has just been such a phenomenal resource uh, in, in our research on the housing market. Uh, you know, I think many people, you know, anyone who works with data is familiar with so many of the outstanding uh, census data products. Um, LEHD is a little bit of a newer uh, data product, um, and I think one that um, perhaps sometimes gets overlooked, but it really does include um, a wealth of, of information. And, and critically, it includes a wealth of highly localizable information, which is so important for, for housing market analysis. Um, because uh, so much of that LEHD data is published uh, down to the census tract or census block level. Um, so, you know, um, as I said, I'm happy, happy to be presenting here. Um, today, as Arlene mentioned, I'm going to present a little bit about how we've used this data um, to look at the housing market impacts of, of tech booms. Um, obviously, this is a very top of mind uh, question um, with the news, you know, this past week of, of Amazon's decision to withdraw from its proposed um, New York, Long Island City, HQ2, um, obviously Amazon and its search for second headquarters has been in, in the headlines around the country over the past year and a half. Um, you know, even well before that, uh, Amazon kind of has been in the headlines here in Seattle where, where we are based um, because of its, its HQ1. Um, but obviously kind of beyond that, that news cycle, this line of research touches on important challenges that communities across the country are grappling with. Um, you know, if we look over the course of the past number of years, uh, job opportunities and employment gains have been, been concentrated, um, particularly though those high wage employment opportunities are, are increasingly concentrated in a number of communities. Um, and, you know, the result is that more and more people want to live in approximately the same places which, of course, absent um, you know, a lot of investment in new supply and construction, has contributed to some degree or another to rising housing costs um, in, in many of the country's largest housing markets. Um, as part of this analysis, unavoidably, I, I do end up focusing disproportionately on Seattle and San Francisco. Um, these are obviously kind of the cities that have been um, perhaps the, the national focus of, of the tech boom. They're also um, kind of cities where uh, more than said, we're, we're headquartered and have offices. Um, uh, so, you know, I think this is where, those are the areas where these issues are most prominent. I've tried to bring in examples from other markets. Of course, 
um, those two areas uh, are not the only areas that have seen growth in tech jobs. There are many other parts of the country, including Washington, D.C., um, uh, in, in, you know, including places like Denver and New York, that are also seeing kind of growth in, in these job opportunities um, and kind of, you know, how to, how to adapt to this growth. Um, so, so that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to focus mostly on, again, how we use the data, touch a little bit on the findings, but not really go into the, the weeds of the methodology. Um, if you're interested in learning more, um, I'll, I'll direct you to some resources where you can find out more about that, that research and what exactly we did. Um, but before I go into the research um, and the data, let me tell you a little bit about Zillow, um, you know, uh, and particularly our, our economic research team. Uh, I'm sure um, some of you, at least on this call, are familiar with Zillow, but some of you might not be. Um, for those of you who aren't, Zillow is the largest consumer-facing real estate search portal in the United States. Um, millions of consumers visit our website each month. They, they come looking to buy, to sell, to rent a home, to get a mortgage, um, and simply to, to often to find information on their communities um, and their homes, which for, for most Americans is the most important uh, asset that, that one um, typically ever buys. Zillow was, was launched about a decade ago by, by two former executives from Expedia, who having just um, kind of you know, had this initiative and, and founded this company to bring transparency to, for, for consumers who are shopping for, for airline tickets, they decided to apply that, that same logic to the home shopping experience. And that's really where Zillow was born. Um, often in, in company meetings, um, our executives describe home shopping pre-Zillow a little bit like um, standing in a dark room, um, and um, you know, you um, you know, you would go to a, a real estate agent and, and try to describe what you were looking for, and you know, they they would shine a flashlight in in one corner or another um, based on what they interpreted um, your preferences to be. Um, when when really, um, you know, all you want to do is turn the lights in the room and, and look for for look at everything that was out there, and, and that's what Zillow does. Um, you know, we have, as I said, kind of provide all that information on homes for sale, for rent. Um, but, you know, um, not only that, we provide an estimate on every home out there, regardless of whether or not, um, you know, those, those homes are on or off the market. Um, you know, so our research group really grew out of that mission of turning on the lights, if you will, for consumers. Um, if you go to zillow.com slash research, that's our, our Essentially, our economic research blog, you can see our mission and principles. Um, you know, we aim to be the most authoritative um, source for timely and accurate housing data and unbiased insight with the goal of empowering consumers, professionals, policymakers, and researchers to better understand the housing market. Um, here you can see a little bit what our, our, our research blog looks like. Um, it's just solo.com slash research. I encourage you to check it out if you're interested. On top of that, research and commentary. Um, we publish hundreds of data series uh, every month, um, real estate market metrics kind of freely available to download anywhere from the national, state, uh, metro, county, city, zip code, neighborhood uh, level. Um, so, so that kind of that housing market data is what we've been able to, to pair with census's LEHD data um, to, to understand, as I said, the housing market impacts of, of these tech booms nationwide. So with that, having said that about Zillow and, and our economic research group, let me go into to some of the applications where we've used LEHD data. And in general, uh, I'm going to comment uh, on three broad themes of, of research uh, where we've, we've used these data. Um, some research is um, kind of more intensive, other research is, is kind of more um, just compelling charts and graphs. Um, so first, as Erlene mentioned, kind of housing and the tech boom. There are two, um, two major pieces of research um, where we've used the LEHD um, origin destination data in particular. Um, that, um, that is one of the data series that LEHD publishes. Um, and as I said, kind of this first analysis that we did probably about two years at this, ago at this point looked at uh, the impact of, of Amazon's original headquarters uh, in Seattle and what that has uh, done to the Seattle housing market. Um, you know, for those of you who are familiar with this, this story over the past decade, um, you know, Amazon has built their, their first headquarters in a neighborhood just adjacent to, to downtown Seattle, a neighborhood called South Lake Union. This is a neighborhood that has been transformed over that period from a, a largely industrial neighborhood to, you know, a, a classic tech hub with, um, with high-rise uh, buildings and coffee shops and, and fancy restaurants. Um, 
you know, Amazon is, um, is not the only employer in this neighborhood. There are a lot of other employers in this neighborhood, companies like the Gates Foundation. Um, Facebook is building a new office there. Google is, is looking at a new office there. Um, REI is, is there. Um, the University of Washington has a big medical center there. So, you know, Amazon, is, as I said, is not the only presence in, in this kind of booming neighborhood, um, but there's no doubt for anyone who's, who's walked around that neighborhood that, you know, they are, um, to some degree or another, the anchor tenant, if you will. They are kind of the dominant presence in, in that neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, this is a question that has been coming up, um, you know, uh, over and over again in, in, in Seattle conversations over the past decade, kind of what has this neighborhood transformation, so the transformation of this neighborhood from um, a gritty industrial district um, into kind of a tech hub, what has it done to the Seattle housing market? So we used LEHD data to um, look at, you know, people who, who work in that neighborhood, which is composed roughly of two census tracts. Um, people who work in that neighborhood, where do they live in, in the Seattle metro area? And these are, are maps that kind of use that LEHD data, both the, the 2015 um, data and then changes in, in those distributions from 2011 to, to 2015 on, on the right. Um, and as you can see, um, you know, there is a relatively high concentration. And the go into a, let's see, a pointer here. And, you know, this area right here where, where the red pointer is, um, is roughly um, the neighborhood that, that is home to Amazon Seattle headquarters at South Lake Union. And you can see there's a higher concentration um, of, of uh, people who work in that neighborhood in those adjacent um, residential communities. Um, you know, roughly this area here is the city of Seattle, and then you um, spread out into the, into the metro area. Um, so, you know, there has been a, a, a relatively high concentration of, of where the growth of this population has been. Um, and so, you know, we were able to merge this LEHD uh, data on, on the distribution of, of Amazon workers and the density in any given census tract um, with uh, our own data on, on rents. Um, our census tract level rent series. Um, and, you know, with a simple change on change regression framework, that suggests kind of that the, the growth um, in, in um, Sublic Union employment over that 2011 to 2015 period explains about 17% of metro-wide uh, rent changes um, in, in the Seattle metro area. It's, it's higher within the city, but, you know, roughly half of, of the Sublic Union workers live outside the city limits. So I think the metro, um, metro comparison is, is more appropriate. Um, this research, as I said, was, was timely. It's topical to many conversations happening in the city. Uh, a year or two ago, it was cited in, um, our, in our mayor's uh, state of the city address. Um, so, you know, this research is, is definitely something that has resonated um, in, in our community. A second um, kind of piece of research where we've been able to take a similar approach and, and use LEHD data merging with our data is to look at uh, the impact of, of IPOs on, on local housing market. And in particular, we looked at the impact of Facebook's 2012 uh, IPO on, on the housing market in the Bay Area, and California's Bay Area. Um, there is a lot of interest right now in, in how housing markets respond to these wealth shocks, the wealth shocks associated with IPOs. Uh, several large Bay Area tech companies are expected to IPO this year, companies like Uber, Lyft, Slack, Airbnb. Um, and, um, you know, and if you look at the long history, you know, it, it is kind of compelling to, to understand kind of what, what can Bay Area homeowners, um, potential sellers expect from, from these, um, these, these events. Um, and I should mention that this is research that was done by my colleague Jeff Tucker. Um, so, you know, what Jeff did is he created a census tract weights, um, uh, a census tract weighted index of home values using weights based on the residence tracts in LEHD data of people who work um, in the Menlo Park census tract that was home to Facebook headquarters at the time of IPO back in, in March 2012. Um, and um, here you can see kind of the main, the main chart that's a result. Um, you know, if you create that weighted index, uh, in, you know, index it to, to March 2012, that's the kind of 100 value on, on, that, on that axis. Um, you know, ho homes in, in census tracts with a higher uh, concentration of, of people who work in that Facebook census tract did see slightly faster home value appreciation um, over the, the subsequent um, year uh, after, after IPO. He found that 
Facebook's IPO was consistent with approximately 1.6 percentage point faster annual home value growth um, in the following year. That's you know roughly about $30,000 of, of home equity for, for homeowners, um, pre-existing homeowners in, in those areas. So um, you know I think as I said, this is a timely question. Um, you know, this is a single event study, but it does provide some guidance, to help you know set some expectations for for homeowners in in um, in the Bay Area. Obviously. Um, Facebook's IPO in March 2012 did come um, at a unique period in the housing market. That's roughly the bottom of, of the housing market after the financial crash. Um, so you know there was a lot of room for recovery at that period. Uh, at this point, you know, um, a half decade plus later, um, with the exception IPOs, the Bay Area housing market is in a much different place. It's probably at, at a relatively high point, um, and um, you know I, I don't think the the next five years of, of the Bay Area housing market are going to look like the past past five years. Um, so you can see here in this next slide some of the coverage uh, these two pieces of research received. On the left, you see the coverage of, um, of the, the Amazon HQ1 research, which was um, featured by, by Gene Balk of the Seattle Times. He's a data columnist for them. And then the um, IPO uh, research was, was featured um, in a story by Kathleen Pender, who's a real estate reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle, um, on, the, on the front page of, of the Chronicle. Um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so as I said, these are questions that um, the combination of, of Zillow and LEHD data have allowed us to, to, to answer um, to some degree or another um, that are of broad interest, um, not beyond, beyond the world of data geeks, which is obviously very important, but to a much broader population. Um, in general, just to kind of conclude this first portion, um, this, this first set of, of research that we, that we focused on. I think these are takeaways from, from this body of research that the, the, you know, the, the labor demand shock associated with Amazon HQ2 and the wealth shock associated with Facebook's 2012 IPO were associated with significant um, but you know, small in magnitude effects on local housing markets, either rents or home values. But in general, you think about 17% um, explanatory power over, over um, rent growth in the Seattle market, you think about 1.6 percentage point um, uh, uh, boost to home value appreciation in the Bay Area. That's probably relatively small relative to the broader forces driving both of those housing markets. There, are, um, you know, as I, I generally say, there are much bigger forces driving those housing markets, and and the macro trends driving um, the national and regional housing markets are, are probably dominating um, what what we're seeing here. So that's, um, as I said, kind of the first body of research where we've been able to use LEHD and and, and, and Zillow data. Um, to look at the housing effects of, of the tech boom. Uh, another kind of second area where a separate LEHD data set um, has been very helpful has, has been looking at price elasticities. Um, uh, the LEHD publishes this job-to-job -job flow series at the metro level, um, essentially looking at how many um, you know, employed adults, as I understand it, uh, have uh, changed their, their uh, place of employment over the course of a quarter um, across metro lines. Um, and I think, you know, obviously that, that concept of um, people moving from one place to another, one part of the country to another, is essentially um, kind of marginal, marginal changes in demand. That's a very important fundamental concept in, in, in real estate economics. Um, and, um, and, you know, it, it kind of has, you know, been very helpful when we talk about kind of areas that are booming and areas that are, are struggling when it comes to the housing market. Um, one particular specific line of question wondering where this has come up has been the so-called California exodus. Um, California housing markets have become particularly expensive over, over the past few years, um, and there is um, a wealth of anecdote uh, and some data suggesting that the growing numbers of people are packing up their bags and, and deciding to move out of the Golden State, um, you know, so that, that outflow, that net outflow has implications. Um, not only for California housing markets, but for the places where these people tend to go. Um, and, um, you know, they, these people, you know, based on the LHG data, do tend to go to go toward, you know, Western, other Western housing markets. Adjacent states tend to be large beneficiaries or nearby states as well. Um, you know, when you look at people who are leaving uh, Southern California in particular, that's what, that's what this chart that you're looking at now does. Uh, it looks at, in, in green, kind of, um, the, the number of people moving out of Southern California to each of these three metro areas over you know, the past uh, decade and a half, almost two decades at this point, 
um, Dallas, Las Vegas, and Phoenix. Um, and then on um, in the blue line, kind of the, the left-hand axis, you see um, the affordability advantage, if you will. That's essentially the difference in mortgage affordability, the share of income the typical household spends in the mortgage. Um, that's how much uh, cheaper in percent of income it is in each of these markets, Dallas, Vegas, and Phoenix, relative to, to Southern California. So you see in general, um, you know, during the mid 2000s housing boom, as, as Southern California home values increased very quickly, um, the affordability advantage of each of these markets kind of accelerated and picked up. You know, in, in 2006, Dallas, um, you know, was about 45 percentage points more affordable um, than, than Southern California. And in, in Vegas, it was 25 percentage points similar in Phoenix um, at, that, at that peak of the mid-2000 housing bubble. As California home values um, dropped back, and of course they dropped also in, in many of these communities as well, um, that affordability advantage um, eroded um, and kind of went back down. Um, uh, you know, and, um, and so again, looking back at that, that mid-2000 housing bust, as affordability in California deteriorated, um, as that affordability advantage in, in these three adjacent markets um, expanded, you saw an inflow, a net inflow of, of people from, um, from Southern California to each of these markets. Once again, over the past um, four years or so, we're seeing growing inflows. Um, those are the areas, the, the parts circled in, in red there. Um, you know, we're seeing growing inflows from, from Southern California to Dallas, to Vegas, and to Phoenix. However, what's different this time is that we're not seeing that affordability advantage. Um, the way to interpret that is that, you know, home prices in each of these markets um, are responding um, to, to the population inflows in a way that they didn't um, a decade uh, and a half ago. Um, you know, affordability is now becoming a concern in places like Dallas and Vegas and Phoenix. So, you know, this is a relationship um, that speaks to, you know, a story uh, that we're hearing from, from people, that, that from, from, from journalists, um, that people are living every day to day. Um, and, you know, it's something that I think is only something that we can do with the combination of these, these two data sets. A second analysis where we've used the job-to-job -job data is looking, trying to estimate this potential impact of, of Amazon HQ2 um, on the various housing markets that they were considering um, back a year ago. Um, this was analysis we did with, with Ben Castleman at, at the New York Times. Um, and, um, you know, we, we tried to estimate, based on the historical relationship between population inflows and rents, um, you know, what could um, each of these markets expect, you know, um, from from Amazon HQ2 with various assumptions about you know how many people would be moving versus how many people would be local hires, um, uh, et cetera, and, and how fast the, the pace of hiring would 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 commence in each of these HQ2 cities. So again, you know this was a question that um, that I think a lot of people had in mind as Amazon was was considering any of its its 20 candidate cities, um, what was going to be the impact from the proposed 50,000 new jobs that that um, were going to be created, um, and this was one way to try to estimate. Um, estimate that those, those effects that, that, you know, something was possible because of a combination of the two data sets, um, but I think was, was broadly of interest, um, you know, to, to many people beyond a, a data, a deep data one community. So a third area um, kind of, you know, where we've been able to use the LEHD data um, to, to talk and to illustrate housing market and real estate trends has been on this, this um, sub, subtopic of housing and transit. Um, you know, we, a couple months ago, this past summer, we, we tried to estimate um, how, how much um, a typical home in a, a given commute radius of downtowns was worth and how much income you need to have in order to afford those homes. So for instance, you think about how, what was the typical price home within a 15 to 30 minute commute uh, of Denver, downtown Denver, same with downtown San Francisco, same with downtown Seattle. And then you think about each of those 15 minute bands moving further and further out. What is the typical um, kind of home value? What's, what income do you need to afford that, that typical home value? Um, this is data um, that we were able to, to, to um, it was a data collaboration with a company called Here Technologies, which, which provided the commute times to downtown. Um, and so you can see, um, you know, for, um, for Denver, you can, uh, you know, how, how much um, the typical home increases or de decreases with each kind of marginal um, 15 minutes of, of extra commute time. Now, this, has, this is data that we um, collaborated with here Technologies. There's no obvious LEHD data here, but there is kind of behind the scenes. 
Um, and one, before I get to the, where the LEHD data are, you can see here kind of what that map looks like for, for the Washington, D.C. metro. Um, you know, what is the median home value uh, for each of those commute bands. But where, is that where the LEHD data come in is this question of, you know, where, what is the commute to downtown? Where is downtown? And I think this is um, urban geographers and economists kind of have tried to grapple with this question and have various hacks to answer this question um, in different ways. Um, you know, one common way is to look at historical retail sales patterns. Um, uh, kind of the way that we've decided often to do it um, is to use the LHD data to look at um, employment density in each census tract. And then, you know, you can select the, um, the census tract with the highest employment density in a metro um, and identify that as, as a downtown core. So here you see Atlanta and you can see the employment density um, back in, in 2005 and 2015. Um, and, and how that's changed. I know kind of um, with all of the census tracts, it's kind of hard to, to, to visualize exactly kind of the shift, but zooming in a little bit, um, you can see here more, more clearly, you know, back in 2005, the census tract with the highest employment density was that census tract there, um, which is, includes the state capital and kind of the neighborhood known as South Downtown. Um, but over that decade, the intervening decade, um, employment concentration gradually shifted northward. Um, and now you can see the census tract with the highest employment density is this neighborhood, um, you know, a couple of census tracts north th that includes the Civic Center and, and Emory University Hospital. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see the evolution of, of cities and employment patterns, um, obviously, in this data. And of course, you know, the, the two biggest anchors in people, most people's lives are, are, are where we work and where we live. Um, and so this gives us kind of that, that critical second anchor of, of where people, people work across any metro area. Um, the, the final kind of use of LEHG data that I wanted to, to point to um, was, you know, just a very simple look at, you know, people who, who live in, in, people who work in Seattle, kind of where, where do they live? Um, and to give you a little bit of context here, um, the, the Seattle metro area, as it's classically defined, includes three counties. Um, King County, which includes the city of Seattle, that's roughly, you know, this area here. Um, Snohomish County to the north. Um, and then Pierce County to the south. Pierce County includes the city of Tacoma right here. Um, now, obviously, there is a lot of commuting within amongst these, these three counties. The further out you go, um, fewer and fewer people commute. Um, but you do have these, uh, these kind of communities out in Kitsap County, out um, across the Puget Sound, um, that are not par formally part of the Seattle Metro. Um, however, you look at a place like um, Bainbridge Island and Vashon Island. These are two islands um, in, um, in, in Puget Sound. Now, Vashon Island is formerly part of King County. Bainbridge Island is, is formerly part of Kitsap County. Um, but a very high percentage of, of Bainbridge Island um, employed adults work in the city of Seattle. The reason for that is that there is a 25-minute ferry uh, across, the, across the sound connecting Bainbridge Island to the city of Seattle right to downtown. So it's actually a, a much easier commute um, than places, you know, say up here in King County. Um, and the way we've been able to use this to talk about it is that there's kind of proposals and even some um, already in, in, in motion um, to include a fast ferry to this, communi this community here called um, Bremerton. Um, you don't see it here, but there's a waterway right here which um, connects uh, downtown Seattle to Bremerton, the city of Bremerton by ferry. Currently, it takes uh, around um, 15 minutes an hour, but um, they're launching a fast ferry which, which takes you know, about 25 minutes to get there, um, passenger only, no cars, but um, that would make Bremerton a much more attractive area um, for downtown Seattle workers um, to live in, um, potentially boosting home values in, in that community. Um, and, you know, I, I think it'll be interesting to see. Obviously, these data are, are only through 2015. The, the fast ferry, I think, launched uh, maybe in 20, 2017 or 2018. Um, but it will be interesting to see how, how that um, share of people who work in Seattle evolves over, over the next half decade um, with more regular um, rapid access to, to the city. Um, so that's something that, that we're definitely watching. That, I think, is all of the, the research that I was going to present to, to you. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I encourage you to, to check out zillow.com slash research, zillow.com slash data um, for, as I said, more details on, on this work. Um, you know, obviously check out um, census, 
uh, LEHD page. Um, their data um, have been supremely useful to us. Um, so with that, uh, I guess, Arlene, operator, I'll hand it back to you for any questions that we have. Yeah, we will now so be go ahead. I'm sorry, Brittany. We will now begin our question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star, then one, and record your name clearly when prompted. If you need to withdraw your question, you may do so by pressing star, then two. One moment as we wait for any questions over the phone. Okay, so while you are, you're all preparing your questions, I would like to take this time to thank Aaron for his presentation. And thank you all for joining us today. I invite you back next month on Wednesday, March 20th at 1.30 p.m. when James Spletzer of the U.S. Census Bureau presents Older People Working Longer, Earning More. And as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star, then one. One moment as we wait for any additional questions. Great, and uh, just one other reminder. First of all, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to thank Erlene and Aaron for this very informative presentation. Um, I would also like to um, let everybody know that after today's session concludes, all participants will be receiving a follow-up email containing an evaluation survey. And we would greatly appreciate if you could take just two minutes of your time to complete it. Um, you can give us your thoughts and feedback. You can also um, tell us how we did today or tell us any new webinar topics that you'd like to see in the future. Um, we really appreciate your feedback, so um, look out for that email. It should be coming shortly after the presentation. Hey, excuse me, we do have a couple of questions on the line. Our first question comes from Lance. Your line is now open. Yes, is it too late to apply for the Census Bureau's field representative position? Uh, I think that question could be directed to our Census Bureau um, job posting instead. Okay, do you know what the website is for that? No, sir, I don't. Not right now. All right, thank you probably be able to help you with that. I'll do some research on my site. Please look out for it on the chat. Um, I'll try to do my best to find the information you're asking for, sir. Yeah, it's because I, I actually have an application for the field representative position with the United States Census Bureau, but it says issue date 8-31-2018 uh, and closing date 12-31-2018, so I'm wondering if it's too late to apply, if those positions have already been filled. That's it. And our next question comes from Dale Donnelly. Your line is now open. Hi, yes. I, uh, I had a question on the, the median price of a home within commuting distance of the downtown core. Seeing as how that, that you all use this third party to identify um, the, the downtown core, is there any way for someone like myself, I'm, I'm uh, an analyst, to recreate that on my own, or would I have to go to Cure Technologies, and is that uh, a paid service, or would that service be free through yeah, so, Cure Technologies? Yeah, so we, we, um, you know, we, we use census data to identify the downtown core. We use Cure Technologies to identify commute distance between any given home and, um, and that, that downtown core. Um, you know, here, um, I don't know the full details. I, you know, I'm happy to provide kind of contact information there. Um, I do think it's, it's a paid service. Um, however, you probably can approximate that distance just using, um, you know, a Euclidean distance between the lat long of the downtown core and the lat long um, centroid of the census tract. Um, and then that gives you a distance in miles, which you can approximate into minutes. Um, it's not going to be a network distance, but it, it's probably a pretty good approximation in most metro areas. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And our next question comes from Joseph Reese. Your line is now open. Hi. I was curious if you or anybody else at Zillow Research has been doing work or is interested in doing work on um, investigating, yeah, this is an example, investigating the effect of uh, tech companies on 
forces like gentrification? Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, that, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, certainly kind of a topic that, that we're interested in researching. Um, you know, we, I, I encourage you to, to check out our research page. We've kind of touched a little bit on um, peripheral topics, but, you know, poke around our research page. If there's something you see up there that helps, great. If not, there's a contact form up there. You can re reach out to the contact form or reach out to me. Um, happy to connect you with someone. We also, um, if you are affiliated with um, a, a university or an academic research group, um, we do make a lot of our property level data available to academic researchers um, for academic purposes. Um, that's a program called ZTrax, the Zillow Transaction, Trans, uh, Transaction and Assessor Database. Um, you can find information about that on, on our webpage. Um, so, you know, lots, lots of opportunities there. So I encourage you to reach out, dig into ZTrax if appropriate for your purposes. And our next question comes from Erica Tanil. Your line is now open. Hi, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, this message is, I'm sorry, this question is for Erin. And thanks again for the time that you took out just to explain a lot of what you explained. So my first question is about the regional migration and the house and affordability when you were talking about, because I, I got kind of confused when you said that people moved from California to Dallas, Texas, Las Vegas, Nevada, and Phoenix, Arizona, based on the Ford, based on the affordability advantage. However, you then said when California became expensive over the one over the first you know two years, now you're seeing some issues within those 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 uh, various other markets. But then you said that now it's something is cheaper. So I just wanted to kind of clarify exactly yeah. what you were saying about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let me, let me kind of walk you through this chart again. I know there's a okay. lot kind of going on yeah. here. So can you can see the chart? Yeah, I can see the chart. Great. So, so the green line here um, is the quarterly number of um, people, again, based on the LEHD job-to-job -job data, who moved from Southern California to, to Dallas, Texas, um, each, each of these metros right here. So you can see kind of during the mid-2000 housing boom, you saw a, a rapid increase in the number of people moving to, to, to Dallas from Southern California that fell back. Okay, excuse Hello? me. It appears as if his line dropped. One moment. Yeah, it dropped. Back oh. in. Okay. Please continue to stand by. We are experiencing technical difficulties. Your call will resume momentarily. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is Deb Rivera. Um, I'll take this this time to go over a few commonly asked questions in the chat. Um, just to review some of these, so will the slides be available? The slides for this presentation will be made available through the census.gov training and workshops page. I'll be sure to send a link to that website or to that site through the chat feature, so keep your eyes out. Um, typically, it takes about 24 to 48 hours to get the slides up on the site. The, the recording of the presentation should take, um, we're hoping, by the end of the week, if not possibly by the, uh, by the beginning of next week. Um, again, I'll send that. Um, Did she go? The link. Pardon me? So, yes, look out for that link um, in the chat box. Excuse me, we are waiting for our additional speaker to dial back in. Please mm -hmm. continue to stand by. Brittany, how many questions do we have in the queue? We have four questions on the line. Would you like to continue with the question and answer session? 
Um, no, we need to wait for Erin at this time. Um, okay. We'll give him a couple more minutes, and then otherwise we'll, um, what we can do is um, I'll give out my email address, and then any questions that went unanswered, you're welcome to send those to me, and we'll forward them to Erin to get them answered for you. But we'll give him a few more minutes. Please continue to stand by. Um, hello. So I, I apologize, this is Aaron again. I guess I, I must have gotten dropped from the call. Um, Welcome back. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll continue where I left off. Um, so yeah, so this green line is um, the, the number of people who moved from Southern California to each of these markets. And as you can see, it increased during the housing boom years as California got very unaffordable, fell during the recession years, and then has gradually been increasing again. Now, if you look at the blue line on this kind of left-hand axis, that is how much more affordable is Dallas compared to Southern California? So if you think about, you know, um, say in Dallas, the typical household spends 10% of their income on a house. Um, you know, this 45 percentage point gap means in Southern California, they were paying 55% of their, their income on a mortgage again. So the higher this line, the, the more affordable Dallas is relative to Southern California, the lower the line, the smaller the gap in affordability there is between those, those two different places. So, you know, as I said, as California got very unaffordable, we saw people moving to that area. And again, you know, um, suddenly we're starting to see more and more people move to that, um, to Dallas from Southern California, but Dallas um, is not kind of keeping its affordability edge. It's, it's actually kind of starting to see affordability deteriorate, um, you know, just in line with Southern California. Um, you know, I, did that, I'm not sure if that answers your question and makes more sense. And her line has been removed. If you would like to ask any additional questions, you're more than welcome to star one. Um, but our next question comes from Walter Johnson. Your line is now open. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I live in the Bay Area, and I am also uh, working on trying to predict uh, house prices in various areas. It's kind of a hobby. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you didn't talk about here is prediction into the future, mm -hmm. okay? Have, do you have uh, techniques that you standardly employ, and, and in particular, do you find long-range techniques useful in a move in a market like the Bay Area or do you have to just basically look at the last two months to uh, make some type of prediction about what's going to be happening um, in the market in the next month do you go back yeah. a year do you go back a month I guess it, I guess it depends on the type of um, what you're trying to predict if you're trying to predict um, sales numbers if you're trying to predict home values and I guess on top of that, what are you trying to predict? Are you trying to predict an individual home's value? Or are you trying to predict um, the median home value in an area? Um, so, you know, I guess without knowing kind of more precisely what you're trying to predict, it's, it's hard to answer that. Um, uh, individual homes generally. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously Zillow has a, a lot of um, resources information on predicting kind of the prices of individual homes. Um, you know, if there's a home in particular that you're interested in, I encourage you to go look at that. Um, that home page on Zillow will have um, a 12-month forecast um, for, you know, for its, its price. Um, but, you know, it, there are people definitely who have spent kind of their careers on this type of question. Um, probably not worth me going to it like on, on, on a call right now, but, um, but I encourage you to reach out to us with specific questions. Um, and check out that kind of particular home forecast on Zillow. Uh, yeah, this, this, that's a big, big question is that people spend careers and, and lifetimes working on. Yeah, well, just the main problem always is uh, around here is it's very yeah. difficult to make any prediction in the fast-moving market. 
Yep. No, that's fast moving markets certainly make it more difficult. Yep. Okay. And our next question comes from Patissa Cabbage. Your line is now open. Hi there. Thanks very much, Erin. Um, I'm with the City of Seattle, and I wondered if you looked at all at rental housing and the effects of um, tech booms on rental housing in the city. Um, specifically, we're are coordinating our work around opportunity zones and just looking for creative measures around increasing of, you know, affordable units, potentially additional dwelling units and backyards and things like that. Um, and Oakland had used 2010 census to understand that around 25% of their housing is actually single family rental housing. So looking at a similar sort of lease model. So just wanted to, those two questions really around rental housing and then yeah. whether you all are tracking opportunity zones as well and, and development of, um, or increase in prices in opportunity zones. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. Two great questions. Um, on rental housing, so the, the analysis on Amazon HQ1 was on, on asking rents um, so, so median rent across census tracts in, in the Seattle metro area. Um, as far as kind of availability of rental units, um, I haven't looked at kind of vacancy or absorption rates, um, but I think kind of your fundamental point that the mix of the rental stock has shifted, um, you know, between single family and, um, and multifamily um, rental units. Um, I typically use kind of ACS data to look at that, um, the, that distribution of the rental stock over time. Um, on opportunity zones, um, my colleague Alex Casey is, is definitely kind of working on that question and researching you know, specifically about what's happened to, to prices in, in opportunity zone areas. Um, happy to put you in touch with him. Feel free to reach out to me if you don't already know him. I know he, he knows a lot of folks at the city. Um, but, um, but yeah, happy to put you guys in touch. That's really kind. That would be great. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. And our next question comes from Seth Falcone. Your line is now open. I had a question about the median income, or the necessary income related to uh, the median home value prices uh, and the cost versus commute size. So just trying to understand how those were calculated. Yeah, yeah. So the necessary income, um, you know, again, takes that median home value in that commute band um, and then backs out a necessary income assuming the household spends, you know, 30% uh, of their income on housing costs. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure we assumed uh, a loan-to-value ratio of 80, um, so 20% down payment. And I forget the exact mortgage rate we used in that calculation. But it was probably something around four and a half, um, which is roughly around current mortgage rates. And our next question comes from Lance. Your line is now open. Yes. My question is, how do you access the chat? I'm trying to figure out how I can uh, access the chat dialog box, but I don't see any uh, corresponding icon in my screen, on my screen. Okay, so um, if, you, if you take your cursor and you hover it towards the kind of the bottom of the screen, right where the PowerPoint is visible, um, typically you get, you get some icons. Um, they look like a phone. Um, there should be a um, a speech bubble. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see it just um, in the center of your screen if you take a closer there. Okay. I, uh, yeah. Is it is, is it uh, to to is it the icon immediately to the right of the phone symbol? It should be. Yes. It, it's blue and it has kind of like a, a an empty speech bubble in the center. And if you click on it, it should open up your chat on the right hand side. There you go. Okay, great. I see it. Thank you. You're welcome. And our next question comes from Casey Martin. Your line is now open. Hey, Aaron. Thanks for doing this, man. This is really cool. Um, I had a question about the chart. You know how you can tell me if I'm characterizing this correctly, but the chart from California, it sounds like sort of the expense of property is sort of following the exodus from Southern California. This chart. Are, what's that? This chart. That you, uh, uh, yes, yeah. right. The, are we seeing the similar, like, is, is, it a, is it right to characterize it as an exodus? Like, are we seeing anything inverse? Like, do mm -hmm. the property prices in California, in Southern California, are they going down at all because of the exodus, or is it sort of being backfilled by other things? Does that make sense? I, 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think access is probably a strong word. That's how I've seen it characterized. Um, it, I think, you know, this is um, total outflow. There's also still an inflow um, of yeah. population in California. Um, small net outflow, I think, is, is, is the correct characterization. Um, but more importantly, beyond that aggregation is the composition shift. I think, um, you know, uh, as California has become more expensive, you do tend to see younger people um, kind of entering the labor market for the first time go there and you see kind of um, older people um, or, or mid to late career folks staying there, um, kind of young adults starting out families kind of who need um, space um, are, are more often than not the ones moving to these um, neighboring areas. Um, okay. So as I said, exodus is definitely a strong word. Um, so it's the, the, older, the older generation sort of cashing out their gains is kind of the but sure. it's being backfilled by, okay. Correct, and then as, as to the point about prices, um, appreciation has certainly slowed, particularly in Q4 um, in the coastal California metros, um, but it's still kind of above national um, paces right now. So for instance, um, you know, the Bay Area has seen a big slowdown, and in fact in Q4 you saw kind of a slight um, decline in median home value. That's the first time we've seen that since 2011, um, I think, um, but um, but the year-over-year -year pace ha has slowed. We're not seeing negative year-over-year -year paces uh, yet. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Then our next question comes from Larry Field. Your line is now open. Uh, hi. Thanks for the presentation. This is yeah. really interesting. Um, I, my one question is I'm doing some volunteer work for a, a local service agency. And I went to the FBI website for crime data yesterday, and I was overawed. Is there a tractable place to go for crime data and looking at, you know, situation, you know, similar sort of analysis that you have here? Yeah. You know, I've never worked with crime, crime data. I know that um, that's something that people have, have tried to look at and, and kind of study it with, with respect to housing. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with that data, uh, so mm -hmm. I don't think I can help you. I'm sorry. And our next question comes from Aaron Raymond. Your line is now open. Hey, Aaron. Thanks so much for the presentation. It's, it's, it's really great stuff. Um, I work for the city of Renton. I was wondering right. if you guys have done affordability advantage studies for entering suburban cities related to tech hubs. That's actually an interesting question. We haven't. Um, uh, but th no, that's, that's a great question. I'll, <laughs> I'll definitely think about it. Um, we, we do, I think we try to do kind of urban, suburban, and rural affordability. Um, but um, but I have to dig that up. Um, yeah, I don't know. If that's helpful. No, no, I appreciate that. And is the Z tracks data is that available for public sector folks to do analysis as well or not? Unfortunately, I think it's only um, university researchers. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. And our next question comes from Candice Blatt. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Um, well, I was looking at the Z tracks, and I was wondering if there were examples of the different kind of studies that have been done using it. Oh yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure we have a list. Um, if you reach out to us, I can put you in touch with the person who who manages that data set, and they might be able to share some examples with you. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah of course. And our next question comes from Kwandin Sensi. Your line is now open. Hi, this is Kwandin Sensi. Hey. Um, so I'm interested in the LEHD data and like you know the frequent of data that how it's refreshed. Yeah, so Erlene, I don't know if you want to answer that. I, I you probably have better knowledge than I do. So yeah, so the LEHD data LEHD data is, uh, we have a partnership with all of the different states um, and other territories. And what they do is they send us their unemployment insurance wage records, and we combine that with uh, surveys and censuses to create the LEHD data. Does that answer your question? Yes, great. Yeah, because I thought that it's like every 10 years, and isn't it that too outdated? But if we work with the state correctly, then maybe it will you refresh more often, so that's great. Is it free? Yes, it's free, uh -oh. and um, so the, the load data is currently 
Uh, we're working it out with one of our larger partners. Um, we have details that we're um, trying to resolve, and once that's resolved, uh, we will be producing uh, the 2016 and 2017 data. Um, but we have other data sets that are current, um, like we have the QWI, our quarterly workforce indicator, um, the QWI Explorer, and then the job-to-job -job flows um, Explorer is also very current. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. At this time, there are no questions on the phone. Great. Um, Aaron, we do have one question from the chat. It's a gentleman that unfortunately can't access or doesn't have access to a speaker. Um, if you don't mind me asking his question, all right, let me just sum it up here in a second. Okay, so the question is, on the migration and home prices data presented by Aaron, does that include only individuals migrating and purchasing homes, or does it include investors moving in those areas and capitalizing on the tech boom? Yeah, so the migration, the job-to-job -job data, and again, Erlene will have more detail on this. This only includes, um, you know, employed um, people. So, you know, people who, for whom their employer filed an uninsurance or an, uh, uh, unemployment insurance claim um, record. Um, so, you know, it's not children, um, it's not households, it's a, a different concept. Right, Erlene? Yes, that's correct. At this time, I'm sorry, go ahead. We do have one question on the phone, one moment. And that question comes from Paulin McCarter. Your line is now open. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I was curious if you could uh, just give a couple sentences about possible connections to other regions in the U.S. Um, I was wondering uh, especially about uh, if the Southeast the southeast is being acting similarly as the southwest that you're showing here. Um, and sorry, when you mean possible connections in regards to these migration outflows or, or home price trends the or what, what did you? The relationship uh, between uh, the sales prices that you're showing mm -hmm. and the kind of affordability and migration yeah. patterns. If a similar yeah. thing is happening in other parts of the country where um, you're seeing migration come out of a uh, more like major urban core um, into maybe some of these like secondary cities. Yeah, absolutely, D definitely. I think um, that's one of the great questions that the the job to job data really allow you to dig into because they are so rich in the those metro to metro pairs. Um, so certainly, a lot of southeast cities have seen migration inflows um, to some degree from pricey West Coast markets, but more from the Northeast. Um, so places like Atlanta, like Nashville. Um, uh, you know, the Research Triangle in, in uh, Carolinas um, uh, and, you know, certainly Orlando and the Florida metros are seeing uh, population inflows. Uh, also on the West Coast, kind of, you know, Northern Californians are also kind of leaving um, to, to some degree to places like Portland, Seattle, Boise, Reno, uh, Salt Lake, um, you know, um, those, those tend to be popular destinations. So it's, it's not only kind of a Southern California to the Southwest phenomenon. Um, this is, you know, people moving happens across the country as well. Thank you. Yeah. At this time, there are no questions on the phone. Okay. Erlene, do you want to, I guess, wrap it up? Yep. Yes. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you again to Aaron for such a wonderful presentation. Um, like I said, please come back next month when we uh, talk to James Bletzer about uh, older, er older workers earning more. Thank you. Thank you for your participation in today's conference. All participants may disconnect at this time. Speakers, please stand by.